Hey, UMass. I am. I am. I am JLB. Jewish Leaders in Business is networking its way around New York City. Vivo. CBS. You direct NYC. Come join us. My name is Matt Dornfeld, and I'm the president of the Jewish Leaders and Business Club here at UMass. This evening marks the culmination of a semester's worth of hard work from our members and supporters. As a flagship Judaic club at UMass, we are overwhelmingly proud to once again host Yuval Adin, whose insights into personal security are unrivaled around the world. A man of great valor, Yuval Adin has a vivid history with international security experiences. As an investigator of cases with notable worldwide impact, he has been afforded the opportunities to reach pieces of history that most of us never will. It is quite rare to discover a person physically and emotionally connected to the big three of worldly issues, counterterrorism, personal security, and financial fraud. In the truest sense of six degrees of separation, one man serves as the link between some of the world's most intriguing former and current leaders. Once former Israel Prime Minister, Golda Meir's personal bodyguard, and recurring consultant to the White House, Yuval Aviv has his hand on the pulse of global events and world leadership throughout recent history. Mr. Aviv was the lead investigator for Pan Am Airlines in the aftermath of the horrific Lockerbie bombing in 1988 that blew a jumbo jet out of the sky and took the lives of 270 individuals, both on the plane and subsequently on the ground. On February 24th of last year, Libya's former Prime Minister, Mustafa Abdul Jalil, made a sharp claim asserting that the now deceased Muammar Gaddafi personally ordered the attack, which has only deepened tensions, uh, excuse me, tensions between the UK and Libya. More recently, he has investigated the Bernie Madoff scandal, scandal and was also hired to work on the Enron case. Due to his work, his firm has recovered over $15 billion worth of assets for its clients. <coughs> for comparison, he can purchase the Yankees and Red Sox five times over with the same amount of money. You may have heard that Yuval Aviv's personal account of one secret mission in the 1970s served as the basis for Steven Spielberg's family unit. The central character, Abner, played by Eric Bonds, is based on Mr. Aviv's experiences in Israel and around Europe. However, what you may not know is that Yuval Aviv is committed to a two-state solution for Israelis and Palestinians and strongly believes that the focus today should be on economic development for the Palestinians not consistent ignorance. <laughs> his endeavors extend well beyond countries and corporations, though. His book, Staying Safe, a complete guide to protecting yourself, your family, and your business, outlines the essential tools for becoming personally responsible for the security and safety of yourself and your loved ones. Without Mr. Aviv's work, who knows how desperate and security starved our world would actually be. <coughs> Over the last year and a half, Jewish Leaders in Business has grown to become a premier business club featured in the Eisenberg School of Management. Our meetings and events are open to everyone. With the monthly meetings averaging about 30 members <coughs> per one, JLB has developed and hosted unique programming that students have found both interesting and cutting edge. This evening, you have witnessed JLB's first public showing of its commercial networking in New York. Roughly a dozen of our top members visited New York City on a networking trip that featured visits to Vivo, CBS, City Hall, and UDirect, and has paved the way for future visits and internships for our members. After filming the commercial at UDirect's offices, one of JLB's own members, Mitchell Black, edited and polished the video shown tonight. We look forward to hosting more networking trips in the future, including one to Boston next fall. JLB, along with the Jewish Student Union, cooperated on the largest project it has ever participated in, titled A Night in Tel Aviv. was a social cultural event based on a night in Tel Aviv, a night's life in Tel Aviv, which all proceeds benefited the Huntington's Disease Society of America. Our project took the campus by storm, selling out its maximum capacity of 600 students after just 80 minutes, and turned away well over 100 at the door. The project has attracted national attention by major universities, including replicate programs at MIT and Northeastern, and a potential future program at UC Santa Cruz. As a quick side note to JLB's members and other interested students, as of this week, I'm extremely proud to announce that UMass Amherst has approved the night Tel Aviv for next semester. <laughs> as JLB continues to develop, it has begun to work its way to closing the cross-cultural divide between the Jewish and Muslim cultures by focusing on 
projects that cater to more than just Judaism. Its first cross-cultural product project titled Laugh in Peace will be hosted at the Newman Center Cafe on Wednesday, April 18th at 7.15 p.m. and what will be a stand-up comedy event featuring a rabbi and a Muslim by the names of Rabbi Bob Alper and Azal Usman. It is our mission that this project will be one of many future projects as we make strides to define cross-cultural cooperation both on our campus and in the community. But for tonight, we unite in our efforts to learn more about the security of the world we live in. Yuval Aviv is a respected Jewish leader in his field both domestically and abroad. We are providing him with an audience this evening out of appreciation for his work and a desire to understand the stories of a man who has witnessed some of the world's greatest perils that the majority of us have only read about. And without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please warmly welcome Yuval Aviv. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. Uh, without Matt, I wouldn't be here. And it's his efforts that brought me back for the second year. I thank everyone for coming in tonight. I have so much to share with you. Um, and I hope you'll find some of the things that I am going to share with you very practical and very important because we are in a very, very uh, unique time. Uh, most of you who read the papers and watch TV understand that the world has become more violent. Terrorism is in the, on the rise. Fraud is on the rise. Um, I'll talk about all those subjects and how they tie in. Um, I want to thank again everyone for being here and thank you, Matt, for inviting me. Um, let me start by sharing with you who I am and why am I an expert in the areas that I'm going to talk to you about. I was born and raised in Israel. I was a major in the Israeli intelligence. And when Golda Meir became the Prime Minister of Israel, I became her personal bodyguard and her advisor on anti-terrorism. That goes back to the late 60s, early 70s, where terrorism was at its, uh, at its height. Uh, you, all of you, or most of you, are too young to remember the Munich Olympic massacre, where 11 terrorists climbed over the fences at night, penetrated the Olympic compound, and walked into the area where the Israeli athletes were sleeping, and killed most of the athletes um, who were there. The world has watched it on TV. It was, but the Olympic Games continued. There was no pause for even a moment. Golda Meir was the first prime minister who dared to come up with a new innovative way to avenge the Munich massacre in such a way that it will send a message to terrorists, you do what you do and we will find you individually. We're not going to bomb countries. We're not going to bomb cities. We're going to look for you individually for the rest of your life, and we will bring you to justice. The information that was at time in hand was that the 11 terrorists who took part in the Munich massacre were hiding in Europe. They thought, in the humble way, that Europe is safer to hide, because Israel is not going to send an army to Germany or Italy or England to look for those terrorists and bring them to justice. So the decision has been made in Golda's office. Let's put together, on an experimental basis, a team of five commando agents that will go undercover in Europe, penetrate those terrorist networks of the day, the Black September, the uh, Bader Meinhof, all those terrorist networks that actually worked with each other and supported each other and penetrate those terrorists, and hopefully they will find those terrorists and bring them to justice. Never done before. Uh, most of those type of operations are controlled by the, by the government, and this is like letting loose five commando agents in a hope that it will work. I was in Golda's office when the decision has been made, and then Golda turned around and said, and Juval, you know, you're going to lead that team of five, and good luck. I was 24 years old. Um, apparently, you have to be young and stupid to take on things like that. Uh, when you get older, you have a lot of things to think about, and you may not want to do those things. 
But nevertheless, uh, I was 24 years old, and the rest of the team, the other four, were in the late 40s, early 50s. So I was worried, was right, that they're not going to listen to me. Um, they have more experience. But I can tell you that we have never had an argument. We have never had a qual. We debated things together, and then I had to make the final decision, and they listened, and it worked. I thought at the time, well, I'm going to go to Europe for two, three months. We'll, we'll be there. We'll travel. We'll find those guys and bring them to justice. We didn't know what we were getting into. It took four and a half years, four and a half years away from our families, away from our loved ones. We could never be seen going back to Israel, travel to Israel, call Israel. We just disappeared. Now, mind you, this, those are the, for me, it was my best years. I was 24 years old after the army. Um, I wanted to continue my education. And here I disappeared for four and a half years um, to something that I never even dreamed of. Well, we were situated in a safe house in Germany. This is where our headquarters was. Now, five guys living together for four and a half years was tough, at, at the least to say. Uh, but again, as I said, we divided the work between us, um, uh, and things work out. Four and a half years later, and during that mission, I lost three of my members. Um, so the two of us finished the job uh, by ourselves. And four and a half years later, one by one, we did find those terrorists, and we did bring them to justice. Um, I then became the head of the Israeli intelligence in Europe, the head of the Mossad in Europe, and then as a liaison with the CIA, I came to America. I decided that the safest place for me to be uh, after this four and a half years uh, would be America, and I was right, I'm still here. Um, the first thing that um, I, I decided to do is really disappear in America, uh, make sure that nobody knows who I am and that I live in America. Um, it didn't take long. Within probably less than a year, while I'm still living in Manhattan, one, afternoon, one evening, actually on a Friday night, I pick up the newspaper, the New York Times, and a big article in the magazine of the weekend, New York Times, featured Munich, the story, and then a big article that suggested that the guy behind this operation, the leading person in the operation, who used the name Avner um, as, a, as a pseudonym, now lives in New York, and his name is Juval Aviv. <laughs> Overnight, it became a circus. Every newspaper around the world sent delegation to New York to look for me. Every TV station had their big antennas in front of my apartment. I really had to go undercover. Um, and I did for a while. Then I agreed to give an interview to all of them through only one newspaper, which was the New York Times. Um, and I, I talked about the Munich. I didn't really get into um, details, but it satisfied them too for a period of time. And you know, in America, um, information, things like that last only two, three months. Six months later, everybody didn't care anymore about it, which was good. I then decided to write a book about it, about this Munich mission. I owed it to the three members of my team that didn't make it, and their wives and kids. And I decided to do that with a uh, very credible journalist out of Canada, George Jonas, who um, decided to take two years of his life and work with me to put together this book, search it, travel, meet, and do what needs to be done. The book came out. Uh, as I said, called Vengeance. It was translated to 28 languages, became a bestseller worldwide, and I thought that this is going to end. I got a call from a producer in Canada who wanted to do a movie about the book. And the first movie that was done called The Sword of Gideon. The Sword of Gideon is a great movie about the book, about the mission, mega uh, um, uh, 
actors, um, and it was uh, actually not a movie in a movie house. It was an HBO uh, miniseries, uh, and only in Europe it was in a movie house. So I got away with that, and I disappeared for a while, and it all calmed down. Then one morning, uh, two, three years later, uh, which is three years ago, uh, I get a call from one morning from a guy who, who suggested he is Steven Spielberg. And uh, Steven Spielberg called, and he called several times. I never took his call, because I thought it's a prank. And then one day I said, OK, I'll take his call. And he said, you know, I read your book. Uh, I know who you are, because I went to Israel. And Israel, the Israeli government suggested, if I want to find you, uh, you're in New York, and they gave me your telephone number. So feel secure about it. <laughs> Thank you for Israel. Um, I decided they probably want to kill me. Um, <laughs> Stephen said, why don't you fly to LA? I'll fly you to LA. We'll spend a weekend, and let's, let's talk about it. He said right away, listen, I'm not, I don't want to do a James Bond movie, because I've done them. Um, I want to do um, a real account. And more important is, I want to talk about the toll that it took on you and you other member of the team, um, because four and a half years of, of, of being in that stressful environment must have taken a toll on you. So I said, uh, he said, remember, it's not going to be a James Bond. I said, how about a Moshe Bond? Uh, he said, no, it's not going to be a Moshe Bond. So I agreed to do that and be a consultant. And the movie Munich came out. Uh, it was nominated to four um, Oscar uh, awards. And it really did it well. It's a great account, a true account of what really happened. Um, last anecdote about this movie, I got a call from Steven and said, you know, you need to meet the actor who's playing you in a movie, Eric Benner. And I really didn't know who Eric Benner is. So in New York, I went to the Four Seasons Hotel, I knock at the door, the door opens, and here stands the 6'2", handsome-looking Australian actor. <laughs> I look at him and I said, Eric, good choice, <laughs> clearly. I said, but Eric, look at me, because this is how you're going to look in 20 years from now. <laughs> he almost quit. He almost decided not to do that. But uh, I'm very satisfied that period have done. I, since then, I decided that since I'm staying in America, I don't want to do anti-terrorism work. I don't want to do anything that has to do with weapons and guns and so on. And I decided to open a private investigation firm in Manhattan, which I did in 1979, called Interfor. Um, originally, unfortunately, uh, that's all I could do, and that's all the office I got, was to protect rock, uh, rock groups when they do their tours. So I did the security for groups like Rod Stewart, uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire, um, um, Prince. Um, then I realized that this is really not my beat. Those guys are all on drugs. I don't want to be. <laughs> I don't want to be part of it, and and I don't want to see it because if I see it, I'm going to put handcuffs on them, and they wouldn't like it. So I decided I have to switch and do something that I can really be proud about. And let me just tell you an anecdote, which you'll appreciate, because a lot of you are going to graduate and look for jobs. And you'll know how hard it is to get new clients and open your own business. Um, I, my office is across the street from the Trump Tower in mid of the middle of Manhattan. So I just opened my office. I have no clients. I sit there all by myself. And I get a call from Donald Trump, because he's across the street. His secretary calls me up, and she says, Mr. Aviv, Donald wants to see you. He has a great big job for you. I was so excited. I put my suit on. I got ready. I took his private elevator to the penthouse. And here, behind a big desk, he was sitting with his big cigar. And he says, Chival, listen to me. I have a big, big assignment for you. Somebody is peeing in my private elevator. I want you to catch him. I was so let down. I was so disappointed. I was so upset. I looked at him and said, Donald, I, Chival Aviv, when I leave your office right now, I will pee in your elevator. 
I didn't do it, but every time I see him on the street, I said, Donald, I'm coming, I'm coming. <laughs> so those were the old days. I then decided, what can I do and what do I do now? And suddenly, fraud has started surfacing. More and more fraud cases where individuals stole millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars, and placed them offshore for old age. And then all they do, they go in and they file bankruptcy, and that's the end of the world. And the way the system works, because there's so many of them, unfortunately, the system really doesn't have the budget, the manpower to follow, find the money that is missing, and they get away with it. They maybe get a slap on the hand, they maybe get a year in jail, but when they come out, they know they have hundreds of millions of dollars waiting for them, and God bless America, it's great. So I decided to start investigating that, finding that money that is missing somewhere around the world, freeze those assets and bring it home for the people who lost that money, the people who were defrauded. I started with cases that were in a $5 million case, and I said then, this is now going back 30 years almost, um, I said then, wow, people steal $5 million, and a lot of them get away with that. 10 years later, 10, 15 years later, all the cases that I was working on were in the hundreds of millions of dollars per case. The fraudsters just decide, if I steal, let me steal big. Why am I gonna take a little money if I can steal more money? In the last 10 years, all my cases, my big cases, are in the billion per case. It's just escalating, it's becoming very big. Fraudsters know the same, the same odd to be caught, the same result, let me do it big. I was the investigator on Enron, you heard about those scandals on WorldCom, Tyco, Conseco, Parmelat, all those big international cases where hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars were disappearing. I'm now the investigator on Madoff and Stanford, the largest thieves, the largest embezzlers in America. Let me share with you something that I normally don't do because um, there's no press here, so I can talk about it. We're now going to see very soon very, very soon, another Madoff that is gonna be surfing will be caught. We are already in the last stages of the investigation, who stole a little over a hundred billion dollars. Madoff walked away with 82, 83 billion dollars. The new guy has walked away with over a hundred billion dollars. Now, this is mind boggling This is the amount of money that some countries uh, uh, have or need to, to have and don't have. Um, this is huge, this is huge. What I wanna just share with you quickly because I wanna get into the security part of it, talk about uh, security, the next terror event that I predict um, and so on. Um, I'm gonna illustrate and I, some of you who have been here last year, I'm talking about the same case because it's a beautiful story to tell how those fraudsters think how they plan and premeditate their, their um, theft. It's not, it's not like a guy gets up in the morning and he, he's gonna steal some money from his neighbor or from his company. This is premeditated scheme that they're planning, they're investing money into it to steal a lot of money from financial institutions, from individuals, uh, and from companies or from stupid investors who think that they're gonna make a lot of money by investing with those guys, as people thought by investing with Madoff. People thought they're gonna make 20, 25% a year, which doesn't exist, uh, and not for many years, um, and it didn't exist with Madoff. It's too, whatever is too good to be true, normally is not true. Uh, the scheme that I'm talking about started in New York to guys, two fraudsters, from India, arrived in New York, and now please pay attention how they build this, that, that theft, that scheme. The first thing that they have done, they have seeked a law firm. Look at the guts. The best, biggest, white shoe law firm in America, which has a big presence in New York, they went to see the managing partner. And they said to the managing partner, good morning, we are two businessmen from India. We are in the fine 
metal business. We do gold, silver, and platinum. And we own warehouses full of gold, silver, and platinum in India. We would like to retain you as a lawyer, your law firm, to represent us in America, to incorporate us in America, because we are going to do a lot of trading business of fine metals in America. And as you know, or probably don't know, every law firm loves those type of clients. None of those law firms go out and check those clients up. If you walk into a law firm and you can pay your fees, they'll, they'll take your case, of course. So the managing partner says, of course we will represent you. Those two guys, next phase, those two guys come back a few days later to the same managing partner and say, and listen carefully how they build it. We are new in town. We don't know any banks. Could you recommend a bank that we can go and open an account so we can pay you your retainer? Magic word. The lawyers wanted to get paid. So the managing partner of this big case, big, big law firm, called the bank that they're doing business with, that the law firm is doing their own banking with for at least 80, 90 years. <coughs> Happened to be the biggest bank in America, JP Morgan. And I can mention name because it was in the press already. They called JP Morgan, he says, I'm sending you two great clients of ours. He just met them two days. But he used to say, good. Now, when the banker hears that the managing partner of this big law firm, who is a known lawyer, calls up and says, those are two good clients of ours, the red carpet was there. Those two guys go to the bank, they open an account, and they wire $300,000 from Switzerland to this new account, and now they're ready for the, for the kill. They come and visit the bank a week later and say, good morning, guys. We would like now to borrow from you $800 million for our new trading account, for our new company, of which you know who the lawyers are. You know they're going to be incorporating us and they're going to run the show. Now, normally, you guys have no experience, but you will when you go out and you want to open a bank account, when you want to borrow uh, a car loan, you want to borrow some money to do business. They put you through the, I mean, you need to, to bring in references, you need to bring in um, uh, um, tax returns and so on. No one, no one in the bank made a phone call to India to ask whether those guys really have that. No one went to India for $800 million. You expect them to do a thorough check. Within one week, they handed them $800 million. Those two guys look at each other and say, God bless America. We are not living here so fast. There's more money to be made. But it's true. They took the money, very cool, and put it into the account in JP Morgan. Now they have $800 million in an account. They went down to Wall Street, did a little cocktail party, and invited the entire banking world in America and Canada to now join this big new company of which JP Morgan already gave them $800 million. Within one month, 30 day on the dot, Every major bank in America and in Canada were lining up, breaking their door, all wanted to participate in this new deal. Now they call it the JP Morgan Gold Deal. It became suddenly JP Morgan's deal. Those guys, the fraudsters, were not even, nobody talked about them. They have collected $4.6 billion Chase gave them a few hundred million, Citibank gave them, you name the bank, everybody participated. Because everybody thought that everybody else did the due diligence, check those people out. But everybody was so greedy because they thought they're gonna make a lot of money. They were drooling over this deal. There was a bank, a small bank in Boston that heard about it um, a week after they already had that money, and they ran to those guys and said, please, we're a small bank, but we also want to be part of this big uh, conglomerate, a big deal. We only have $50 million, please take our money. And those two guys turned around and said, no, sorry, the deadline was last Friday, and we can't take your money. 
And everybody said, wow, see how honest those people are. They had a deadline, and they don't take any money after the deadline. Well, if you have $4.6 billion, what's another $50 million just to look good? So on a Monday morning, they have wired the money out of JP Morgan in New York, first to the Cayman, from Cayman to Singapore, Singapore to Hong Kong, Hong Kong to China, and they and the money disappeared. Monday afternoon, I get a call from JP Morgan, who is a big client of mine anyway. They call me up and said, Juval, can you quickly come over? We have a small problem. <laughs> I walk into a room almost as big as this auditorium. There are hundreds of people yelling and screaming at each other. Apparently, there were 11 banks who were defrauded. And they each had their own law firm. They're all sitting there in, the, in this big conference room and pointing the finger at each other. I thought you did the deal, and I relied on you, and nobody did. So JP Morgan said, Juval, listen, you're the greatest in what you do. Go find those two guys quickly. Find the money because it's embarrassing. I said, well, it is embarrassing, but JP Morgan, not so fast. Before, before I take the assignment, I have a word with you guys. I bank with you guys for 17 years. My corporate accounts are with you. I came to you three months ago and ask you for a credit line of $400,000 because I opened a new office in San Francisco and I needed a credit line for them also. And you asked me three months ago, three years tax returns, you wanted fingerprint, urine test, blood test, I mean all those tests that you give to the small guys, which you haven't done with those guys, and you are still thinking about it. So I'm canceling this application and I'm putting in now in front of all those witnesses a new application. I want $500 million because I have gold warehouses full of gold in Israel. <laughs> they looked at me and they said, you know what? You're gonna get this one faster than the other one. So the rule of thumb, and let me teach you guys, a lot of you are graduating, you're gonna go into the market. Let me teach you how to do the fraud, how to do a good fraud and not get caught. <laughs> well, rule number one, rule number one, if you steal or you do something, do it big. If you do two, three, five million dollars, I'll catch you in two hours. <laughs> so you need to hire, you really need to steal a lot of money, hundreds of millions, tens of millions of dollars, so you can hire good lawyers to help you defend you. And then you have good accountants, forensic accountants and accountants who will help you to do all kind of, 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 of uh, uh, trusts and whatever it takes to shield your money. <laughs> Second thing, once you've done that, when you take your money, don't just open an account in Alabama or something. Don't move to a different city because it's not too far. I'll catch you again. <laughs> so what you need to do is to, you need to immediately wire the money, the money you stole, and do what those two guys did. Send it first to the Cayman, send to you know, Bahama, whatever you want in the Caribbean. And after a few weeks, two, three weeks, wire the money, all the money, to Singapore, go from Singapore to Hong Kong, go to China, move it back to Europe, you're safe. Why? Because the government, the police, the, anybody that is gonna go after you guys will not have enough budgets, we don't have the manpower budget to follow the money in all those countries. What happens, unfortunately, in America, this is a bad story and, and really, really sad story, the banks are writing it off. So if you're lucky and you moved a few times and you file bankruptcy and you tell the judge, I took it, but I don't know where it is, I lost it, it moved, I, who knows where it is, nine out of 10 times you may be going to be discharged and you walk away because they don't have the budget. I know because I get the calls from all those banks. I get the calls from the courts who call me on a daily basis and say, we have a big case for you, but we have no budget. And I say, thank you. What do you think I'm working? Uh, uh, for free. Um, if you don't have a budget, do it yourself. But only the high profile cases where they <coughs> can't hide and write off, they hire people like me to go out and look for the money. What I'm trying to say, the message I'm trying to send is not be a thief and, and, and get away with that. 
Uh, the message is that whoever in this audience is studying accounting, studying financial uh, um, um, science, forensic accounting, which is only a different word for an accountant who looks for fraud or looked into fraud cases, is the hardest, hardest um, profession right now in America. It's not only accounting firm who would hire you, it's also law firm, companies like uh, myself, I, I employ 35 accountants, 35 forensic accountants. Well, five years ago there were accountants, now they're forensic accountants. They're just going through specializing in the area of fraud. So I'm just telling you guys, those of you who will graduate and go into the market, don't close your eyes, open your eyes because it's not just the accounting or the accounting firms that you should go and put your resume in. Start looking into companies that are employing forensic accountants. It's the hardest, most growing um, area right now in the country. I'm gonna stop talking about fraud. I wanna talk about the next threat. I wanna talk about cybersecurity. The likelihood that you guys are gonna be attacked by a terrorist is small. Let's, let's be honest with that. Uh, what is more likely that your credit card, your personal bank accounts will be hacked and you lose your credit, you lose money, you now need to go through hell to explain to the bank, to the credit card, to the financial institution that you didn't do it, that somebody else did it. Those of you who had the experience can tell the horror stories. What does it take to just clean your record up again after you have been hacked. And let's talk about how easy it is to do. Because the technology to hack into people's computer or to hack into your uh, um, telephone, smartphone, Blackberry is out there. Let me just tell you, and I'll confess, part of my investigating tool, I have all those capabilities, I have all those equipment. Let me just share with you, again, by anecdote. Recently, I flew from Amsterdam to, um, to New York. I have offices now in 36 countries, so I'm really global in what I do, and I have hundreds of employees worldwide. And I was flying with one of my employees from the Amsterdam office, who happened to be a hacker. We, I employ hackers, we need them. Um, young kid, just out of college, we get onto the plane, we take off, and as you know, if you've seen it, every time you fly, the minute the aircraft takes off, everybody is taking out their laptops and they start doing what they're doing. So he's taking out his laptop. I don't travel with a laptop for the following reasons that you will know right now. I don't have a laptop because I don't want to be hacked. Uh, he looks around, he says to me, pick up any, any laptop here. Tell me which one you want. I said, please don't do anything. Are you crazy? <laughs> That's all I need. I'm, I'm, don't, you're fired before you even get to New York. No, he said, don't get excited. I just want to show you what I can do. I said, okay, 2B, the woman there, 2B, she's working happily on the computer. He says, just for a moment. And I really don't know what he was doing. I'm not a computer person. He was hacking into it, playing with it. Two minutes later, I look and the woman starts looking around. She's panicking. He sends her a message. Hello, I'm in your computer. I'm checking what you're doing. You have spelling mistake in your letter that you just sent. <laughs> Let me help you to correct it. I said, what are you doing? Are you crazy? <laughs> Now, he says to me, do you want to see her letter? Do you want to see what she's working on? I said, no, boom, two minutes, it was in his screen. He happened to be a lawyer working on a big case, on a brief for a case. So I'm just telling you what this guy did, many other people know how to do, and it's spread right now, it's wide, it's very popular, and people are doing it to each other. So your laptops, with all the security you think you have, are wide open. The same thing are your phones. I have equipment in my office that I can, not me, but the people in the office, um, get into your computer, into your, into your um, um, telephone, smartphones, Blackberry, 
copy everything in it, and when you send your text messages, it's being copied, you don't even know it, and we'll have it in our office simultaneously. I just need to have the telephone number. You just need to have your telephone number. Now, that's another thing. We have equipment that we use to surveil. This is for surveillance, but just think about it. I, can, I have a equipment that looks like a hair dryer, really a hair dryer, and I can beam it wherever there is glass, and whoever sits behind the glass, I can listen to all the conversation better than they listen to themselves, which means I can drive behind your car and beam it into your windshield or in the back glass, and you're on the phone talking, you think you are alone, I listen to everything you say, and I can record it. I can also come into any parking lot in front of office building, and I can beam it into any office, any um, glass, any window, and if there are meetings in this room, if there are conferences and so on, I listen to what it is and I record it. Now, is it legal? Absolutely not. <laughs> it's not. But the technology is out there. The technology has, and unfortunately, it fell and is falling into the wrong hands. And who is the victims are? You are the victims. Because they can do things that you don't even dream about. Take your identity, take your bank accounts, take you and play with it, your credit cards and so on. <coughs> Let me tell you another thing. There's now new equipment that the Russian mafia in Brooklyn have introduced, and we're still studying. It's a small suitcase, attache. They can walk next to you and just stand, and I don't know what they do, they push a button or something. It can read all your credit cards on, on your body. You don't even know, you stand, at the, you stand at a red light, you want to cross the street, they walk next to you with that, and they're recording. And let me tell you a story. I was a victim. So let me tell you, it's a funny story. I walked into Bloomingdale's in New York to buy aftershave. And as you know, you go into the counter and the nice lady behind the counter gives you the aftershave and she says, cash or credit? And I said, credit, take my credit card out. Normally I don't watch, you know, normally I don't look, I look at other things while she's doing the accounting, goes to the, the uh, machine. But if you, you need to pay attention now that I told you that many times they take your card and they go somewhere else. They don't do it in front of you because the other machine is empty, uh, is not occupied, who knows. So I happen to look at her of what she's doing. And she takes my card and on her way to the next cashier by the end of the counter, she stops, she takes her own personal uh, purse, a bag, out, uh, out she takes a black box out of it. She takes my car, she runs it through the black box. She puts it back into her uh, purse, puts it back, goes to the cashier, now the cashier comes back. I said, excuse me, what was this black box? She said, what, I didn't do anything. I said, you know, I'm sorry to tell you, I took my badge out, and guys, it doesn't mean anything. But to her, it meant a lot. <laughs> took my badge out, I said, listen to me, I'm gonna arrest you now, and tomorrow morning, your picture is going to be all over the newspapers, your family gonna be embarrassed, and I went, and since you, I think you are from the Eastern Bloc, from Russia and so on, because most of them are from Russia and blooming there, uh, the girls, uh, I said, I hope, you are, I hope you're legal in this country. She got white in her face, she almost died. She said, please, I didn't do, you know, she says, all the girls here have those boxes. I said, well, this doesn't mean anything to me. What about my box, my, my card? She said, well, I got this box from the Russian mafia in Brooklyn. My job is to run 20 cards into this box. It's a reader. And then every Friday, I bring it back to them. They give me $5,000 in cash, and they give me a fresh box to work. She says, but everybody has it. I said, okay, don't move. Um, I said, I want to see the director of security. The director of security arrived and happened to be somebody who worked for me years ago. So I said, David, what's going on? I told him the story. He said, oh, Juval, you don't know. It's an embarrassing. Every employee has one. <laughs> They're all doing it. It's an epidemic. He says, worse than that, every waiter in restaurants has it. Now think about, you go to a restaurant, you have dinner, they, you give the waiter your card, they disappear somewhere, you don't know what's going to happen to your card. So guys, 
you're going to be a victim sooner or later because those cars, those boxes are all over now. The government can fight it. It's complicated. They're trying. The FBI has told me when I talked to them about it, they said, listen, nobody gets killed. If those guys are stupid to give them a credit card, they're not supervising it. Who cares? So the government really doesn't care about it. So I'm just telling you how new technology, cyber technology, hacking, is not only what you read in the paper that affects big companies, they broke into somebody's computer and they stole information, it's gonna affect you sooner or later and more sooner than later. Let's talk about cyber security and its leads into terrorism. Cyber security, according to the US government right now, is the next hardest terrorism mecha uh, uh, tools that we have not even yet experienced in a large scale. What does it mean? It started, as you all know, hacking into other people's computers and stealing government computers and so on, started actually by young kids on campuses, They're using university campuses computers, they know how to do it. Kids today are maven, amazing how they, what they do with computers. They started hacking into the FBI, the White House, and so on, just as a prank. It worked. Now, organized crime realized this is an opportunity. We can use the technology in those guys. Let's hire them. They can work for us, and they can go into corporation and steal credit card information, they can go into companies like Amazon, like who, when you want to buy something, you have to buy with a credit card. They have the records, they have the information on your credit card. They stored, they store millions of those credit cards information in a computer. Guess what? That computer was hacked twice this year, and hundreds of thousands of credit cards were stolen and are now being maxed by somebody in Moscow, in Leningrad, or even in Europe or America. So that is becoming a generation. Some of you, I hope, remember, we had a blackout in New York um, in 2003 that lasted three days. The whole Eastern Bloc was, was, was dark. That was not an accident. This was a cyber attack on the grid, on the electricity grid. It was terrorist networks were testing it. We, I don't want to get into who did it and what. That, it's, a, it's not important right now. What's important is that that three, four days that the country, half of the country were in the dark, cost the taxpayer $30 billion. <coughs> The latest information we have right now in Washington is that the next attack on a grid will not only be the little uh, uh, East Coast, it's gonna be nationwide. And they believe, based the government believes, based on their study and uh, assessment, that if they do it this time, it will take nine months to recover. Nine to 13 months. Now, just imagine this country in the dark for that long, the economy is gonna topple. This is, just imagine that just you guys here, there's no electricity. You're in the dark. And it's gonna go through winter, and it's gonna go through summer. So we're lucky if it's summer, but we're not lucky if it's winter, and there's no heating, and there's no, there's gonna be a, such a disaster that will affect everybody. That's the next generation of terrorism, it's cyber. It will go into factories. It will destroy R&D or research, new research of new uh, medications and so on that take years to develop. It can kill it overnight by sending viruses into computers. Where does it come from? The largest group of hackers today, the most professional ones, are in China. Uh, there's a village somewhere in China that the government, Chinese government sponsors, where young kids who are computer mavens are being put into that village for several years, and they develop viruses, they develop things. As a tool for the Chinese government, this is how they're gonna either attack another country or defend themselves. 
We are now working very hard in the United States to pick up and figure out. You all have heard, and a lot of you have talked about, uh, heard about, is that Israel and the United States, using viruses and cyber attack, have attacked the nuclear facilities in Iran and stopped production for several good months, destroyed a lot of the R&D there. It was in the press, uh, Israel never admitted, America never admitted, but it, everybody knows where it came from. Um, Iran is now planning a retaliation. They're not stupid, they have scientists, they have people in the computer area, they're trying to do the same to the United States. Nuclear facilities that could suddenly get crazy and, and, and stop or explode. So there's a lot to think about. But let's talk about something that's more tangible. One month before 9-11, I delivered, I'm a consultant to Congress and the White House, and I delivered to the White House a package from Israel that included information that within 30 days, there will be a major attack, terrorist attack, in the US that will include hijacking of planes, and they will take those planes, use those planes as flying bombs crashing into buildings. I was there when everybody were laughing. They said, ha, 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 you Israelis, you see terrorism under every green tree. It will never happen in America. 30 days later, it happened. The information also suggested the terrorists are already here. They're already here, have been trained, nobody believed. <coughs> I was, I'm a consultant to uh, Fox News, and I was on the O'Reilly Show. This was one a week before the bombing in the subways in London. And I'm on the O'Reilly Show, and we're talking, talking about terrorism, I'm the expert, and so on. And then he says, you know, you are an expert, or you think you are an expert. Tell us about the next event. When will it happen and where? He caught me really in a, in a surprise. Now I can assure you, I had no information. I didn't know. I don't know where it came from. I got up and I said, in one week, it's going to happen in Europe. And if it's Europe, it's going to be England. And if it's England, it's going to be London. And if it's London, it's in the subway. So O'Reilly said, I'm going to write on a piece of paper what you just said. I'm going to put it in an envelope. We'll keep it. And you are invited to come back next week. And if you are right, you're, of course, a hero. But if you're not, you have to tell America what kind of an expert are you. I went home. I said, what did I just get into? My whole reputation is on the line. What am I going to do? At the time, bin Laden was alive. So I said, I have to call bin Laden. I need some help. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't have to call Bin Laden. A week later, it happened in the subways in London. Um, I'm not really a magic. I don't predict things. This is not what I do for a living. But what I want to tell you, and it's beyond prediction. This is now beyond prediction. This is more than a prediction. That within the very short time, between now and June, July, there will be a major terrorism attack in the US again it's going to be like 9-11, but it's not going to be an aviation. Terrorists know by now that they cannot hijack a plane in America, North America, for a long time. Not because we are security so good. It's a joke. Um, it's because they know that the passengers are going to get up and are going to tackle them. They know that. Just imagine three guys get up and with cutting knives 10 Hadassah women are going to get up and sit on them, <laughs> and the hijacking is over. So they know that. And they also know some airlines are tougher to do that. I don't know if you've flown Delta lately, if you've seen the steward, how the stewarded looks like. You don't want to tackle with them. <laughs> so I can tell you also that I just flew Delta, and they knew about because I already said it before. And when I walked in, they said, what's your food? What's your drinks? <laughs> and I didn't drink. I didn't eat the whole flight. Um, they have my picture probably in every airport now, oh, Delta. Uh, but nevertheless, what the information we are gathering now in the Middle East, uh, cheddar, uh, information, hot information that comes in, that the next event will be a mass transportation attack. Rush hour, 
um, a rush hour in the morning when people go to work or rush hour in the evening when they go out of it, they're going to pick up 10 cities, so far it's 11 cities now, 11 cities in America, where they're going to do the attack simultaneously. Simultaneously to kill as many people as they can in America and to affect the economy, because they know that this will affect our economy or now is very fragile. And something of that magnitude will do that. So we're talking about trains, we're talking about buses, we're talking about malls where people go and gather, um, maybe ball games, maybe, uh, we, we don't know, but we know it's mass transportation. It's really something that the country is not prepared for because in the last 10, 15 years, since 9-11, all the budgets the government has is going into aviation because the government is still fighting the war of yesterday, which the terrorists are not doing. They're not repeating it. They're doing something new. So the airports may be secure, may be secure with all the equipment that doesn't work and the people who have you seen them and have you, have you worked with TSA? Um, or Gansu, where they take your shoes off, the pants off. Let me just give you an anecdote of how great the security in the airport. You'll appreciate. When Senator Kennedy, the guy who died uh, recently, you know, Big Belly, I flew before he died. I flew with him on the shuttle from New York, from D.C. to New York. So he and I walking in the afternoon into the TSA office in the airport in D.C and a big bully TSA guy comes to him, not senator, he said, you, to the senator, you, take your shoes off, take your pants off, take your stuff. So I thought he was joking, who doesn't know Senator Kennedy? And where was the last time a senator hijacked a plane? So I thought it's a joke, but he wasn't joking. So I went to him and said, excuse me, this is Senator Kennedy, what are you doing? When was the last time the senator hijacked a plane? So he looked at me and says, who are you? I said, I'm just an innocent bystander. I'm just traveling with him, and I just don't understand what you're doing. He said, okay, you stay here, don't move, and you, Senator, you, not Senator, you take your shoes off. So Kennedy said, you know, leave it alone. So he looks for a chair with his big belly. By the time he sat down and took his shoes off, the plane left already. But that wasn't the problem. Now, I wish I had a camera because this is a Pulitzer Prize moment. While he's checking Kennedy, taking his belt over and so on, two guys who look like Bin Laden, and when I say look like Bin Laden, they looked at the time more than Bin Laden than Bin Laden himself. Two guys with a beard, with a turbo, with a, with a big backpack, going through security, and nobody's, nobody's stopping them. So I go to him and I say, excuse me, to the guy, look, Bin Laden, Bin Laden's brother. <laughs> He says to me, are you mocking me? I said, I'm not mocking you. I'm just telling you, you are checking Senator Kennedy. Bin Laden and his brother just passed by. <laughs> he looks at me, now he's upset. He says, you, take your shoes off, take your pants off. That. <laughs> so that's the extent of the great security we have in airports. This is just an, an example. But let me just say one thing, and I don't want to leave you demoralized that those things are going to happen. Let me just tell you things that you don't know and you need to start thinking about. And the only reason I'm really here is not to entertain you, but I want to make sure that when you walk out of there, you think about what I'm about to say now. The terrorists are here again. They're already ready. They're waiting for who knows whose sign they're waiting for to do what they're doing. I predict, or we predict, that maybe it has to do also with the idea that Israel may attack the nuclear facilities in Iran, and Iran has no other response. What are they gonna do? They have nothing to attack anybody, and the only thing that they can do very professional is terrorism worldwide. And they're working on it for the last two, three years since Israel announced we're coming. And they're preparing, and they have their own people already ready. What I'd like you to know, one thing that you don't know, and you won't see it, not on TV, and you won't read in the papers. The US government made a decision a year ago, if there is an attack anywhere in America, in any city, a bombing and so on, the government will shut down all communication in this country for 48 hours. There will be no landlines, no Blackberries, no phones. Everything will be shut down. 
you will not be able to communicate with your parents, with your relatives, with whoever it is, because no one will have a phone. It won't work. Second thing that they have added to make it uh, more whatever, and, and I don't understand what they're doing, uh, is they have shut down, they're going to shut down all the MTA, uh, MTA machines, money machines. You won't be able to take money out of the machines. The third thing that they're now planning to do and they're working on, they're going to shut down all the gas station, no pumping of gas for 48 hours. So now just imagine there's a big bombing somewhere. You're trying to call your parents. The parents are trying to call you. You can't. There's nothing. You can't take money. You have, if you don't have a, a, a tank full of gas in, your, in, in a parking lot, uh, you're in trouble. If you only have half a tank or quarter, and I recommend you should go to, to bed every night knowing you have a full tank just as a precaution for the next few months, you are stuck. What can you do? You cannot stop this attack. You will not be able to prevent it. Um, the government is, is admitting, I just, uh, I don't know if you watched TV about a week ago, the head of the CIA, Panetta, had just announced what I've just said. They're expecting a major attack in North America on a very short time. Uh, he didn't want to go further into detail. So the government knows, the government prepared, they just realized that they have missed 11 years since 9-11 to prepare everybody for such an attack. What do we do? It's not so much what do we do to prevent, you can't, but what do you do the day after, or the moment after the bomb occurred. Therefore, I urge you, and I cannot tell you how much I'm urging you, on your next trip home, to sit down with your family, with your parents, with your brothers, with whoever it is, with your grandmother, with your older people who are not living together, have a meeting on a Sunday afternoon, and talk about what are we as a family plan to do in case we can communicate. And worse than that, what happened if there's a bomb going on in the neighborhood you live, or a whole area is contaminated with chemical or biological, and no one can go home anymore for a period of time until they clean it up? Where do you meet your parents? You can't call them, there's no phones. Unless you prepare and say, okay, in case there is a bomb, there's no communication, we all know if we can get home, there has to be a designating area, a, an address somewhere that we all meet. And you need to say, okay, we all go to our friends who live so, so somewhere, or we do it with relatives, and you exchange it, invite them in case they are stuck, they can come to stay with you. Unless you make the arrangements, unless you talk among yourself what to do and where to go, guys, you'll be surprised. Secondly, I highly recommend that you initiate in every household, you get yourself a small suitcase, you put in the suitcase two, three bottles of water, two, three flashlights, a ham radio, um, some granola bars, Stuff that you can take with you and just for the first 24 hours. Now, the reason I'm saying that, that suitcase should be placed not in a basement under a lot of stuff that nobody knows where it is if there is a problem, but it's placed in a house where everybody knows where it is. Then you need to take, and this is your job, you're the young ones, you need to really initiate it, is to take every important document that your parents have, life insurance, birth certificates, credit cards, passports, make a good Xerox of those documents. Make two, three copies of it. One copy you put in an envelope and place it in the suitcase. So you know that if you run away and you take a suitcase, you can start your life again. You have I ID, because you know, you're not gonna find it under duress at home. Secondly, you take another set of it, put it in another envelope, and place it at the meeting point that you have designated. It's an uncle, it's a relative friend, and tell them, hey, I'm gonna leave an envelope here, sealed envelope with some of our documents. You do the same, leave it with us. If you guys don't do that, shame on you, because you're gonna remember what I just said when it, God forbid, happens. The last thing that I wanna share with you, and then I'll be open for questions, is that I remember 9-11. Parents never made arrangements to pick up their kids or heaven has anybody else 
know that if they can pick up the kids from kindergarten, from school, from somewhere, that somebody else besides the parents will go and pick them up. 9-11 occurred in the morning. Parents took their kids to the kindergarten, to uh, first, second grade. I'm not talking about the older ones, but the young, young ones, and went to work. Thousands, hundreds, and if not a thousand, of them didn't come out of the Twin Towers. Both, on many occasions, father and mother died. Now, at the end of the day, New York is under commotion. Schools are not ready to keep those kids after hours. The kids, the little babies, didn't even know the parents are dead. And they did not, and the parents did not make any arrangement with relative friends. Hey, if anything, God forbid, happens to me, go to pick up my kids at school. Nobody did. Worse than that, the teachers in school left the school, ran to take care of their own kids. They're not at the same school. So there were hundreds of little kids in Manhattan strolling the streets, crying, looking for parents at 10 o'clock at night, dark. The city is in commotion, and there's no parents. Nobody's coming to pick them up because no arrangements have been made. So I'm suggesting that this is one of the things that you guys should do. You should, if you have brothers, you have uh, um, people that have younger kids, advise them, they need to make arrangements with neighbors and friends. We'll pick up your kid, you pick up that, in case you don't want to let those poor kids go through a nightmare like this again. I highly recommend you guys as a group, and I don't know how you're gonna initiate it, I'm not creating a, a uh, I don't know how to call it, even a sabotage here in, in, in UMass, but I'd like to know, and you want to know, what arrangement did UMass do in case there is an attack on UMass? Now, the latest thing that I want to tell you, that on those cheddar that we have, some of the plans that the terrorists have is to attack universities, colleges, because they want to kill kids. They want to kill adults. It's not a big thing to kill. But if adults lose their children, this is going to be more effective. The outcry is more effective. So universities, and how easy it is to drive trucks, to drive vans full of explosives, park them here. People don't see anything strange and report it to anybody. You're not even looking for anything strange. You're not ready for it. You need to know what the school, what arrangements did the school do to protect you guys? And God forbid if something happens, is the school really ready to keep you guys here for a longer period of time, provide you with what needed, because you cannot go home, you don't even know if your parents or relatives are alive, because there's no communication. You guys really need to sit down among yourself, among this group of people, and talk about what do we do as a group? Maybe not everyone has a car. Maybe not everybody can drive away from here. There's gonna be no mass transportation, no buses, no trains. So, I want you to not panic. I want you to just sit and think. And the more you plan, the better you're off later. And guys, don't wait. When I said this time, don't wait, it's not a prediction about uh, something happens a month or a week in London. This is a serious prediction that something will happen. And it's going to be in such a way, it's not a plane bombing, uh, crashing into a building that doesn't affect anybody else except the building and the people in New York City. This is going to affect everybody this time. I'm going to stop right now, and I'm going to ask you to ask me any questions you have, and I'll be glad to answer. Yes? Who is, I didn't, who is bombing where? Uh, blowing up the gas pipeline. Uh, oh, oh Egypt, the Egyptian Egypt. gas pipe that is going through Sinai and yeah. serving Israel and Jordan, yes. which has been attacked and bombed several times now and, and stopped the production. Um, this is a group of terrorists that are based in Sinai, most of them old Al-Qaeda type, who want to create a tension between Israel and Egypt because Israel and Egypt under Mubarak at the beginning were good relationship. 
it's still a good relationship. There's some tensions. It's the government, it's politics. The tension that you see and hear about is not the people of Egypt or the people of Israel, it's the politicians. And somebody needs to instigate that. And Al-Qaeda took upon themselves to do that. They're using the local Bedouin who um, for money will, will do whatever they need to do because they're poor and they don't have money. It's a big issue and it's been addressed right now. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yes. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, how do you feel about the, uh, the body scanners that are being used in airports now and uh, what's called a uh, new lapse of security as a result of using those instead of uh, metal detectors? Um, I, thank you for the question. Um, I just finished a study for the, for the U.S. government, for Congress, on the quality of security we have in airports in America. I'm not talking about abroad. The equipment, the x-ray machines, and so on. Let me report you because I already published it. It's published in Congress. Uh, Congress hides it. They don't want the public to know about it, and for good reason. The study has shown that none of the x-ray machines in any airport in America can detect any bombs that we have to worry about. <laughs> what it is that those, the technology behind those scanners was tw is 25, 30 years old. They've never renewed it. At the time when those scanners were, the, the x-rays, the stuff that we go through, were designed, they were designed to find metal bombs, hand grenades, guns, knives, bazookas, whatever they used at the time. For the last at least 20 years, bombs are made out of plastic. It's none of the equipment will detect it, and the government announced that it will take another 11 years before they can come up with new technology to address the type of bombs that it is. So for the next 11 years, you're on your own, kids. Um, there's nothing there to protect you. What are they looking what they're looking for in the screen, only God knows. For all purpose, they can do cartoons on the screens and enjoy themselves because they're not going to see anything anyway. Then you have the X-ray new machines that you have gone through where you stand there and uh, they take pictures of you, X-ray you, and so on. Well, it's good if you work in those airports, th those guys who are watching it in the other room and look at everybody naked standing there, and if you stay, spend some time in the airport, you see that normally what they, they have one, the normal one, they send all the ugly people through, and all the young, gorgeous-looking girls go through that one, the naked one. <laughs> I mean, we studied that. It's not a joke, and it's not a thing. So it's sad, but this is what it is. So the equipment doesn't work. Um, it's a lip service because the government is not prepared. They don't know what to do. So it's a lip service in the hope that nothing will happen. That's all it is. Yes? Um, I have two questions. One's brief and the other one. Just louder, please. Um, have you heard of the book Gideon Spies? About yes. The is that an accurate book? Yes, it is. Yeah. Yes, it's a good and, book. And the other one is, what was Golden Meir like? <laughs> oh, Golden Meir. Let me tell you something. I have to tell you just one, two anecdotes about Golda. I used to pick her up every morning at 7 a.m. with another bodyguard, and every morning the same story. We used to come to pick her up at her apartment, and Golda was in her morning gown every morning, same, cooking breakfast for herself and us. She doesn't have a butler, she didn't have all those things. She was to do breakfast for her and us. And I walked one morning into her apartment, and I opened the door, and she said to me, just one moment, she goes to the phone, and she calls my mother. She calls my mother and says, what are we going to do about Yuval? He doesn't eat. He's too thin. <laughs> now, now that I'm working with other presidents, uh, you know, uh, Obama and, and all the rest of them, I've never seen them calling anybody's mama and telling them that they're um, too thin and so on. Uh, Golda was an unbelievable, tough woman. If she liked you, there's nothing that you can do wrong. She would, she would back you up. If she didn't like you, there's nothing you can do right. She'll find faults in it. People were really afraid of her. I traveled with her to New York, 
and we stayed at the Waldorf Astoria. And at 10 o'clock at night, we put her to bed, door closed, and, this, and we go to our center, and we were supposed to pick her up in the morning at 7. Two hours later, somebody runs in and walk, wake, wakes me up. I'm her personal bodyguard. Juval, Golda is gone. I said, oh my God, how am I going to explain it in Israel? I lost Golda. <laughs> what do you mean? He said, you won't believe what happened. <coughs> she didn't want to wake us up. The boys need to sleep. They're young kids. They need to sleep. She took the elevator down by herself, got into a cab, and went to Brooklyn to visit a friend. <laughs> a, half of the police in New York were on their feet looking for Golda until we found her at a friend's house. And we found her, she said, what's the, what's the problem? I'm sitting in a cab in New York. Do you think anybody would believe that Golda is in a cab? They'll think somebody looks like Golda. And she's right. But believe me, it's not the right thing to do. <laughs> so that's Golda, yes. Um, what steps can we take to limit our risk of being vulnerable to having our uh, personal information stolen or hacked? What steps can we take? I, uh, first of all, you are entitled to do a credit check on yourself with all the credit agencies, there's three of them, the main ones, for free. You're entitled to once a year. I highly recommend you call one of your credit cards, and they provide now for um, maybe a dollar a month or whatever it is, a service that they monitor even other credit cards and so on. So pick up one of the main credit cards you have. They'll provide you with the security. I also would l highly recommend that you keep information not loosely around. Don't keep social security numbers, date of birth, things like that in your wallet. If you lose your wallet, people have the whole, the whole caboodle in, in one place. Don't, when you fill up applications, as many times you walk into a store, they want to have your, your date of birth or they want to have your social security. Don't give it. Believe me, they don't need it. <coughs> they just want to have it for, 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 for their verification. But minimize giving out information. And the most important things, don't give out your credit cards. You see, what I do right now, I go to a restaurant, I go to dinner. After dinner, when the waiter comes in, I say, excuse me, I'm going to the cashier because I have guests here. I want to pay. I'll make a story up. I don't want them to pay. I'll pay. I go to the cashier, and I stand there and watching what they do. No more giving the cashier, the waiter, my credit card, and it disappears. You guys have to, I mean, it's, you have to change your life. It's a lifestyle change, unfortunately. And it's, once you get used to it, it's not a big burden. You have to be more alert of giving out information. To whom are you giving it? <coughs> Why are you giving it? That's really, uh, and do credit checks on yourself as often as you can. You can Thank do you. it every quarter, I would do. Yes? Um, you mentioned the US's 48 hour plan in case that attack. Um, that you predicted happens in um, shutting down all communication, ATMs, and gas stations. Obviously, from a civil liberties lens, that's questionable. But even from a, a national security lens, don't you think that could potentially pose a bigger risk I in agree. an asset? I agree. The com it will cause more commotion, more problems in this country than the attack itself. You're dealing with a government who has a reason why they're doing it. I never understood it. When I questioned it, why do you shut communication? The answer was, we don't want the terrorists, when they run away, to communicate with each other. Now, I told them I live in Israel. For 30 years, I fight terrorism. I've never heard two terrorists put a bomb somewhere, and then they run and calling each other. Ahmed, how are you? Uh, <laughs> where are you going? Don't forget to take money out of the ATM machine. <laughs> I mean, please. I mean, so, and trust me, I did the same, same type of shtick that I did right now in Congress when I testified. They didn't think it was funny. <laughs> they didn't think it was funny. How do you explain the fact that in the last 10 years there wasn't any other bombings on uh, United States planes or soil. Okay, uh, that's a good so question. For sure, a lot of uh, people have tried that. So uh, you discredit the security in airports, but the fact is that these new machines he was talking about are not X ray machines from 30 years before, but new scanners, millimeter wave scanners. And you have IMSs in airports. And obviously, no one could do a bombing in the last 10 years. So okay, let me answer that. The, the reason to scare the people, like there's no security in airports. Okay, let me, let me, let me answer that. A, um, I still stand behind that the equipment is not sufficient to detect bombs. 
Secondly, let me just give you an exercise that I just did with CNN. I took him to, to one of the airports in New York just to show how easy to do certain things. I don't have to, as a terrorist, go through security and try to go on plane and hijack planes. You and I will go home, we'll pack up a suitcase full of bombs, Semtex, take a cab, go to any airport in rush hour where the big flights to Europe are leaving. And when you come in, you come out of the cab, there's no security outside, the way we have in Israel, some of it, undercover, people outside in the airport, they're already watching who's coming in, and, and there's some, some certain body language that detects that. So now you walk in with two suitcases, take three guys, and you spread in the airport. You join airlines, the, the lines where people buying tickets or checking in. Now, you, I, I detect you Hebrew, speaking Hebrew? Okay. In Israel, you could not come to Lord Airport and leave a suitcase and, and walk away. People who stand there won't let you do it. They'll tackle you. You're not going to leave a suitcase. Here, we tested it. We, you walk in with a suitcase, you leave it in a, in a line, and say to the guy before you, excuse me, I'm going to the bathroom. Can you keep an eye on my suitcase? So far, everybody said yes. Nobody said, are you crazy? Where are you going? Don't leave the suitcase here. So now, I don't even have to commit suicide by staying there because I can't leave the suitcase. I will leave three suitcases in the airport packed with hundreds of people. I haven't gone to security yet. Go outside, push a button, and the whole terminal is in the air. That's number one. So the security is not there. A Korean guy with a gun can stand up here now and shoot all of us. You got What's it. The yeah, no, there is a difference. There's a difference because the airport's supposed to be secure. Here, we're not pretending we're secure. The second element is, second element, when you pick up your luggage in some of the airports, the carousel that you're waiting for, as you've seen, the suitcase, if you don't pick it up, it goes into the airport again and comes back again. It's a round one. You, the same three guys with a backpack full of bombs, come to the airport, sit on the carousel, and it takes you out into the airport, into the tarmac. Now you are under aircraft or being fueled, you know, there's nobody there. We tested it. The security is not there. The, the, the way we do it in Israel, the idea behind how serious we look at all those things, doesn't exist here in, in the United States yet. We're working on it, but we are light years away, and the attack is around the corner. I lived in Tel Aviv for the last six years. As I recall, we had some bombings in the last six years. Where you, cannot, uh, you, cannot, you cannot close You cannot close the country, and you cannot do all of it. But we don't have the minimal security where we involve the public. You see, in Israel, as you know, people are more alert. How many times attackers are being caught by, by people? You won't see it here. You won't see it here because we have 90 million people in America who go to work every day. There are 90 million pair of eyes that could be trained by Homeland Security to report if they see something unusual. It doesn't exist here. We missed the boat. We lost a lot of very important time to do what we can do. Will it prevent 100% now? No, there's still always be an opportunity to do something. But it's much easier to do it in America than it would be in Israel. Not because of the size of America, it's because how we treat security in Israel. The latest thing is, for example, that they will try to attack Las Vegas. Now, I don't know if you've been in Las Vegas when you've been late lately. I just came back, I'm there at least months and months. In Las Vegas, which is no security whatsoever, all I need to do is to drive a Humvee full of explosive Friday night to Bellagio, to Caesar Palace. I don't even have to commit suicide. I valet park it. We think bombing wherever we go. One of the nicest things about living here is that you don't have to get your back checked. When you I, I, I agree, but we're, we're, we are in bad times. We are now in such times worldwide that you want to de see additional security because we lived through 9-11, and it's how easy it is to do another one, not through aviation. And that's all we're talking about. It's not to prevent it, and not to put a policeman in every corner to, to make it a, a police country. We don't want that. That's why we all live here. But we don't have the minimum <laughs> that we need under the circumstances where terrorism is at this time. Any other question? Yes. Uh, 
I'm, I'm, I'm sorry? What city or university did you protect for their third day? I don't know that. I really don't know that. They're just talking about it, and there's more and more chatter about it, and we get more information from various countries. But we don't know. If we knew that, believe me, the government would have acted on it already. Yes? So really confident about, like, an attack on the student. Like, why isn't that all over the news? I, I didn't hear you again. I said you seem really confident about an attack coming in like a couple months, like you said. Like, how come that isn't all over the news? It is. I don't know if you just read the papers. I mean, look at the interview. Just look at the interview that Panetta did. Go back and just search on whatever engine. Just read the papers and watch TV and look for Panetta testifying in Congress two, three weeks ago, what he said. It was in the news all night. So it was. It was. It's, it's, it's more and more people are talking, uh, people who are in the know and people who should know about security and so on are talking about it. They're all talking about an event is imminent and it's coming. And I'm not here to scare anybody. I just want to open your eyes and make you think, what have I done to protect myself and my family? That's all you need to do. We want to thank Jamal Aviv. Thank you. controversial because what he's trying to do is to promote a dialogue so that we are aware of the potential problems in our situation. So I want to thank you even for the challenging questions and for the respect that you have shown. And I do hope that in some way you go out and talk about what he said, whether you agree with it or not. And we look forward to as Jewish leaders in business, and again, we work closely with the Muslim Student Association because we think those cultural bridges are really important. So we look forward to seeing you at future events. Matt, thank you very much. Thank you, Matt.